Suppose that we have a particle approaching a wall. The velocity vector is perpendicular to the wall and the speed immediately before impact is 30 meters per second. Now we can forget about gravity because we're only talking about the speed immediately before impact. So gravity is not really going to come into this even if there is a gravitational field. It's probably better to pretend that there's no gravitational field. So the velocity vector doesn't change as the particle approaches the wall. Suppose that immediately after impact the speed of the particle is 20 meters per second. Obviously the velocity vector has reversed direction and its magnitude has shrunk. Now usually the speed decreases after impact. Well actually the speed always decreases after impact. The ideal situation is where the speed after impact is equal to the speed just before impact. Um, so that's the case of elastic collisions. I'll discuss that later. For now we note that the speed immediately before impact is proportional to the speed immediately after impact. Now we have to be careful here. I'm talking about speeds. You know, if, if we want to make sure we don't get confused with vectors, with velocities, we could write it like this, indicating the magnitude of vector u or the initial speed and here we have the final speed. So this means that if, say for example, we double the initial speed. Okay, so let's say we change 30 to 60 meters per second. What's going to happen to V? Well, since, U is, since the speeds are proportional, V is going to double as well. Okay, so this is what has been observed experimentally. So this means that we can write, say, the initial speed as some constant multiple of the final speed. Or what we usually do is we take the final speed and set it equal to a constant multiple of the initial speed. Now the constant that we use is called E. It's denoted by the letter E it's got a name. It's called the coefficient of restitution. It depends on the materials. It depends on what the particle is made of and also what the barrier is made of. Okay, so, so you know, to go from a proportionality relation to an equation, we just multiply by a constant. But we normally have the constant multiplied by the initial speed. Of course, we could turn this around and write initial speed is 1 over e times final speed. So anyway, this is what's normally done. Now since we observe that the speed v is always less than the initial speed u, e must be a number that lies between 0 and 1. So for example, in our case, you can see that v is 40 so it's equal to e times u, which is 60. So e is 40 divided by 60, which is 2 thirds. So the coefficient of restitution for the materials, um, that is for the particle and the wall, is 2 thirds. Now let's consider extreme values for e. e. E could equal 0, actually. Although, as I said earlier, it's never equal to 1, although we can make it very close to 1. Let's take the situation where E is 0. So in that case, the final speed immediately after impact is 0 times the speed just before impact. Well, that's just 0. So what happens in that situation? Well, if that's the case, the particle doesn't rebound from the wall. So the particle just sticks to the wall. Its final speed is 0 or if there's gravity acting, it, it may fall down, of course. Um, but again, gravity do is not really an issue here because we're looking at the speeds immediately before impact. Obviously, this is exaggerated, so you can see the vector. But immediately before impact, the speed might be 60 meters per second. So the effects of gravity don't count over such a short interval of time. Now we can talk about the initial and final ki kinetic energies of the particle. 
Okay, so again, we can forget about the potential energy due to gravity. So we're only interested in the energy of motion of the particle. So just before this particle strikes the wall, you know, we could calculate its kinetic energy. It's half its mass times its speed squared. So now I leave its mass as m, and its initial speed we can write like this. Of course, of course, the other way to write it is just u without an arrow. But it's understood that u is the speed. It's not a vector. It's not a velocity. Um, k final in this case is clearly zero. Half the mass times zero squared, which is zero. So. In the situation where E is zero, all the energy of the particle gets transferred to the wall. Well, all the kinetic energy goes in into the wall. Of course, it may al it also goes into deforming the particle. If if we if if a ball sticks to the wall, then the deformation of that ball um, involves energy, and that en energy comes from the kinetic energy of motion. Okay, well, a ball is probably not a good example because a ball would probably rebound, but um, anyway, that's the idea. Kinetic energy drops to zero. Now, the other extreme is where E is equal to one. So V is equal to one times the initial speed. So the final speed is equal to the initial speed. So if the initial speed is 60, the final speed is also 60. Now, in reality, this never happens because a certain amount of the particle's energy gets transferred to the wall. The particles or molecules in the wall vibrate and the particle is deformed to an extent, so a certain amount of energy is, is always lost. But if E was equal to 1, we would have what is called a perfectly elastic collision. So the kinetic energy of the particle before the collision is equal to the kinetic energy after. There is no loss of kinetic energy. Now let's write a vector equation to um, relate the final velocity to the initial velocity, not just the speeds. Well, you can see clearly that the velocity vector changes direction. So v has got to be a negative scalar times u vector u. So we just stick a minus sign in here. E is always a positive number between 0 and 1 as I said earlier. So you know multiplying E by the vector doesn't change its direction but if we stick a minus sign in here we change its direction. We uh, switch the vector over. So this equation fully describes the relation between the velocities and also the speeds. If we just take the magnitudes we get back to what we had earlier indicating the relationship between the speeds. So let's look at this situation here. Actually this is what we saw before. Well, we had an initial speed of 60 and a final speed of 40. Now let's uh, look at the velocity vector. So I'm going to take directions to the right as positive. Now that's just arbitrary. I could have used the directions to the left as positive. So in this case u is going to be a negative vector. Okay, so v is 40 plus 40, and that must equal minus e times vector u. Well, vector u is minus 60. So I'm, now these quantities are vectors, so I'm putting in the plus sign to emphasize the direction. So um, e is going to come out to be positive. e always has to come out to be positive, of course. So e is just 40 over 60, which is two thirds, as we saw before. e has no units. You know, from this equation up here, E is just a ratio of speeds. I could say a ratio of vectors, but it doesn't make sense to divide one vector by another. So I go back to this equation, which involves dividing speeds, dividing magnitudes, and that, that's allowed. The units of speed, of course, are meters per second, so it's obvious that the units cancel out. So E has no units, it's dimensionless. So the velocity vector e is always a scalar multiple of um, the initial velocity vector u, and that scalar is negative. So that means that if we double vector u, we double the magnitude of vector v.
if we were to triple vector u, we would triple the magnitude of vector v and so on. Now let's take the situation where the collision is not head-on. So um, the collision is at some angle other than 90 degrees. So we call this an oblique collision. As soon as the particle strikes the wall, there is a, for a contact force on the particle due to the wall that's normal or perpendicular to the wall. Now again we forget about gravity because we're just looking at the situation immediately before and immediately after impact. So gravity doesn't come into this, but it's probably better to pretend that there is no gravity in this problem. So that the resultant force on the particle is F. Okay, we can now apply Newton's second law. The resultant force is the mass times the acceleration vector. We could write the acceleration li vector like this here. We're just dealing with a problem in two dimensions. So x is pointing to the right, y is pointing vertically up. But notice that the y component of the acceleration is zero. f is entirely in the horizontal dir direction, so we can just forget about this part. a y is zero. So there's no acceleration of the particle in the y direction. So let's look at the vertical component of the particle immediately before impact. Okay, it's vertically down. Um, we can call it ui. So th this means that vector ui does not change. So it does not change before the impact because we're assuming no forces act on it before the impact. We're forgetting about gravity. Um, the only force that acts on the particle is f, which is horizontal, pointing to the right. No. Um, no change in ui in that situation because there's no force in the vertical direction. So ev even during the collision and after the collision, the vertical component of the velocity is ui. It hasn't changed. We can also see this from the definition of the acceleration vector. If the acceleration vector is zero, is it's constant for all times. Okay, zero um, for all times. Well, to get the acceleration vector, all we have to do is get the difference of two velocities, any two velocities, because the acceleration is constant. We don't have to worry about an average acceleration because the acceleration may be changing over a certain time interval. So it doesn't matter what the time interval is. So we take some velocity at some time and subtract an earlier velocity and divide by the time taken for that change to happen. And, you know, the numerator must be zero, so we conclude that vy equals uy. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what um, these two velocities are, they're going to equal each other, okay, no, no matter what time interval we take, because the acceleration is constant. Okay, so um, that's the vertical component. Now let's consider the horizontal component. Component, Of course, that's a very different situation because there's a force on the particle in the x direction. So that's going to change the x component of the particle's velocity. Now we can get the relationship between the horizontal components of the velocity before and after the collision using this relation here which is identical to the relation we saw for the case of a head-on collision, where the particle strikes the wall at 90 degrees. It's the same relation, but now we just look at the x components. The y components stay the same. So, um, e, as we know, is a number between 0 and 1. So multiplying e by the initial, the x component of the initial velocity has the effect of shrinking this vector. So v of x is smaller in magnitude than u of x because some of the energy of the collision goes into the wall. Now let's consider these two angles. The angle between the trajectory of the particle before it, it hits the wall and the normal to the wall and the angle between the path of the trajectory of the particle after collision and the normal to the wall. So we could refer to the first angle as the angle of incidence. So this is the angle the particle makes when it's incident with the wall. Um, 
and let's look at how to get those angles. Well, angle I is also in here, okay? This line is parallel to this line. These are corresponding angles. So tan, in this right angle triangle, tan I is opposite over adjacent. Well, we're just getting the magnitudes here. Okay, just to avoid confusion with vectors, we could indicate it like this. So I is some acute angle. Um, similarly for tan R, R is this angle in here. It's up, tan R is opposite over adjacent. Um, the vertical component of this, um, the velocity divided by the horizontal component. Okay, so how can we compare these two angles? Well, you can see in general that R is going to be bigger than I. Okay, because the tan of R is bigger than the tan of I. Um, first of all, note that what's on top is the same. Um, UY equals VY. So I could just write UY here. So the numerators are the same, but the denominators are different. Using this relation up here, you can, you know, VX, as I said earlier, is less than UX. Okay, we can see it in the picture, as I've explained earlier, because we're multiplying by a constant that's between 0 and 1. So this denominator is less than this denominator over here. So that means that this entire fraction is greater. So tan r is greater than tan i. Which means that for acute angles, and we're just dealing with acute angles, angles between 0 and 90 degrees, um, the angle of reflection is greater than the angle of incidence. Now, what's the situation in which r is equal to i? Well, that happens when, when vx equals ux. I don't mean the vectors, I mean the speeds. The vectors are certainly not equal because they point in opposite directions, but if the speeds are equal, well, if we go back up to this here, you know, if, if we take the magnitude here, if the speeds are equal, then e must equal 1. Okay, we saw that earlier. So if the speeds are equal, it means that e is equal to 1, and we have a perfectly elastic collision. So there's no loss of energy, no loss of kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of the particle immediately before the collision equals the kinetic energy of the particle immediately after. That never happens in reality. E is always less than 1. But if it did happen, you know, these two angles would be the same. And if the situation would, of the particle colliding with the wall would be identical with a particle of light, say a photon, colliding with a re reflective surface like a mirror. So a stream of photons or a beam of light um, is instant on the reflective surface like a mirror and the reflected beam makes the same angle as the instant beam with the normal. So that's a perfectly elastic collision. If we think of light as consisting of streams of particles called photons.